There are some objects that come to define the richness of a museum's collection. We tend to call these hero objects. These are things like the Mona Lisa for the Louvre, the Rosetta Stone for the British Museum, and for the Tank Museum. One of these is Tiger 131. Now, it's not technically necessarily the most important tank in the collection. It's not necessarily the best tank in the collection. For some of us, it's not our favourite tank in the collection, but it is the most famous tank in the collection. In this video, we're going to look at why Tiger 131 is not merely the most famous tank in the museum, but arguably the most famous tank in the world. Now, many of you watching this video will know that the reputation of the Tiger is as much based on myth and appearance as reality. But this vehicle embodies the key messages of the Nazi propaganda machine, of Hitler's obsessions with, with size and scale and strength and power. What the German tank designers revealed on Hitler's 50th birthday certainly looked the part and it sent a shudder through the Allies when they saw this monstrous new machine featuring in Nazi newsreels of April 1942. Now there's no doubt that the British were alarmed by the scale, size and power uh, of this new German vehicle, but it was going to be a year before they could get their hands on one of the real things. In Tunisia in April 1943, Tiger 131 was abandoned after an engagement with the Sherwood Foresters and 48 Royal Tank Regiment. It was the first Tiger to be captured intact by the Western Allies and was considered a really important prize. Uh, to the extent where it was inspected uh, both by Churchill and King George VI while it was still in Tunisia and then shipped to London where it was displayed on Horse Guards Parade. Tiger crews had orders to destroy disabled tanks rather than let them fall into enemy hands. So it remains a certain amount of mystery around why Tiger 131 was abandoned. But recent research by the Bournemouth University Forensics Department suggests that because of the way the tank was damaged due to its open hatches, at least three of the crew were probably wounded. Uh, the engine uh, was recorded as, uh, later on as, as easily overheating, so the engine was probably broken and probably not working at the point where the tank was abandoned. And the last straw was when the turret was disabled following a round jamming between the turret and the hull. The crew gave up and went to the rear. And that meant that the Tiger was captured intact and its secrets could be revealed. But with hindsight, perhaps the Tiger is a tank that never lives up to its hype. It's a tank where those upsides are outweighed by the downsides. Yes, it has a tremendous psychological impact on the battlefield just by being out there somewhere. It indeed has the best gun in the world in this tremendously powerful 88mm. At the time, it has the best armour in the world and its mobility is perfectly adequate. But there are just too few Tigers for this to be a war-winning weapon. And these tanks are an economic disaster zone. And they are so expensive, and weapons like this are so expensive, that they lead to a direct contribution to the downfall of the Nazi regime. The propaganda around the Tiger was highly successful. It kept Allied crews in a, a permanent state of what was known as Tiger terror, of, of fear of encountering one of these ferocious machines. And you could even argue that the ripples of that Tiger terror, of that effects on our soldiers then, make us now remain victims of Nazi propaganda, even 75 years later. There were just too few of them, and they were too intensive in their maintenance requirement for them to ever dominate the battlefields of the Second World War. You have to ask yourself, if Tiger tanks were so good, how come so few survive to this day? No one chose to remanufacture these things after the Second World War, and no one chose to operate them. And of over 1,300 produced, 
only six of which Tiger 131 is one of them, survive to this day. Of those six, it's the only one that still runs, and this was after a major and complex and expensive project to return the tank to running condition. Compare this to the large number of T-34s and Shermans still in good running order after all these years. Yes, there were more T-34s and Shermans, uh, so the spares availability is better, but there's more to it than that, and we should know. The Tiger tank takes an absurd amount of maintenance and it's difficult and expensive to fix when something goes wrong. Today, we run Tiger 131 twice a year to take part in our Tiger Day events and Tiger Day attracts thousands of visitors from all over the world to see this unique vehicle in action. It's something you cannot see anywhere else. No other tank in our entire collection could carry a show on its own like Tiger 131 could. And for us as a museum, it's great to see the enjoyment and the engagement that this tank brings. But most people never get a chance to see what goes on behind the scenes to make that kind of event possible. It is over-engineered. It is complex in ways, but at the same time, it is, it is wartime technology. But yeah, you can't just go to the Maybach dealer and say, oh, can we have some new uh, cylinder heads? But yeah, it, it, has, uh, it is a bit more complex than your average T-34 or Sherman. But I guess that also makes it a bit of an engineering challenge. So you build the knowledge of the vehicle and how it behaves and you can react to it. And you start to notice fairly quickly if something is out of sync with how it normally runs. So you build up knowledge of operating in that way. Of course, uh, Mike and some of the others were involved with the engine overhaul, the engine that's running it now. So a lot of more you have a lot better knowledge once you help assemble and build that motor. You can more easily identify a problem because you know exactly how it works. So we take it out uh, before it goes out uh, to, to Tiger Day these days. We service the vehicle if needed and we run it up to temperature to make sure everything performs for the following week for the big event when obviously several thousand people are standing in the arena. The last thing is you want is to find out there's a problem there and then. When I first drove it, I'd be lying to say if I wasn't nervous. Who wouldn't be nervous driving, you know, a 70 year old tank, the only running one in the world and all eyes are on you. So yeah, I was nervous. Actually, it's really nice to drive. The only uh, thing is the restricted vision. You've got to have someone on the ground that you can really trust where, where Mike was been involved with Tiger for so long, so we've always had an understanding. Inside when you're driving it, it's so noisy, it is really noisy, because you've got the transmission right next to you. It's quick, for an old tank, it's very quick. Um, you know, I can get it up to six gear, and it feels like you're doing 100 miles an hour, really, but it is quite scary inside, yeah, but um, it is a quick bit of kit. We found with the Tiger, um, after driving it, you know, there's things that need adjusting, because this is quite finely tuned for this gear change to operate. And what I've learned in the past, I just give a little bit of clutch, just to assist, because if you get it wrong, the tank can rear up and it can snatch the tracks. And we're the tracks, we've only got the one set of tracks on Tiger. We can't afford for them to take in that much pressure, you know, and, and damaging the tracks and the final drive. I've got to drive it right and to make it look good because um, Tiger Days, everyone's got a camera, they want to see it perform, they want to hear it, they want to hear it change gear, they want to see it manoeuvre and so yeah, it is, it is an experience to drive around and get it right. It, it's all for the visitors really and for us, you know, we're all tank nuts at heart so it's just an enjoyment. Like with most historic machinery, it makes such a much, I always keep saying it, it makes it three-dimensional, if you, once you see it running but it's so unique and it, it brings it to life you start thinking what was it like for these guys on the eastern front or wherever they operated the vehicle in this case of course north africa as well what was it like for these guys on 131 they would have heard that exact same engine sound out of exact same vehicle so it makes not only a link to the past but it gets you to understand what these vehicles are about not only as an, an impressive engineering feat of engineering but also quite a sinister and uh, impressive uh, weapon 
Um, and that would be a different experience if it just sits there. We all get that. So once you see it doing a lap in the arena, it is impressive. And especially when it goes out by itself because it's just this one machine in the arena. And you think and very few other vehicles will have this real dominance of the territory always. The museum has made the vehicle famous and we continue to build the history of the vehicle. People come to the museum sometimes just to see the Tiger. It is impressive and of course we want to share that with people. Uh, that's our job as a museum. We want to share history and that also means the history of the object and how it operates. It's the only survivor intact with its combat history so you want to make sure that it's being looked after. We, we will try 200% effort to make sure we can save the original rather than replace it and that's why this balance of Keeping it running with keeping the original components is very important to us and I think it also will be to the, the visitors because they want to know it's the real deal. We're losing the veterans now unfortunately. Uh, we have done the last sort of obviously in the last few years unfortunately with these uh, great individuals um, and in some ways the, the machinery outlives them and, their mem and maybe that's part of remembering them as well when it, uh, when it comes down to operating these machines. Uh, despite all the work we do in uh, servicing and maintaining and repairing the vehicle, we obviously realise that uh, one day we may have to park the vehicle up in the museum and uh, let it live the rest of its life in uh, retirement. So Tiger 131 was originally returned to running order for Tank Fest in 2004 following a huge internal and external restoration and it made it around the arena just. This was an immensely yeah, difficult project, but we were feeling our way in the dark through the unknown. We didn't have access to anyone with experience of operating and maintaining the vehicle. We had to learn for ourselves. Indeed, some of the 2004 work got revisited in 2010, and we continue to improve the way we look after the vehicle as we learn more about it. I mean, there was no Haynes manual for the Tiger then, although by a happy coincidence, there is now, and this handy guide will help you do your own Tiger rebuild projects in the future. And there are a few rebuild projects currently underway, so Tiger 131 won't be the only running Tiger tank forever, but none of the other ones will have the authenticity of Tiger 131. Because what makes Tiger 131 such an important piece for our museum is its story, and it's that story and the continuity of its existence, which is at the core of its value as an artefact. Just look at Tiger 131 and you can see what makes it different to the other Tigers, because it still bears the scars of its final battle. It has the field modifications made by the crew. We even have a photograph of them, although to this day we don't know who they were. And we know what happened in its final fighting moments, giving this tank a very human dynamic. We know that in the advanced attuners, infantry from the Sherwood Foresters Regiment took a hill known as Point 174 from the Germans. The inevitable German counterattacks culminated in an assault of German armour, among which was Tiger 131. The infantry at this point were exhausted and were surely set to be overrun. But 500 yards behind them, nine Churchill tanks from 48 Royal Tank Regiment and 142 Royal Armoured Corps arrived on the battlefield just in time to fire on the advancing enemy tanks. In a dangerously precarious situation and unaware of the Churchills taking up positions behind them, the Sherwood Foresters turned an abandoned German anti-tank gun and prepared to fire at Tiger 131. And in the following exchange of fire, a Churchill tank is knocked out and Tiger 131 ground to a halt, having been hit multiple times. Almost 80 years on, Tiger 131 is no longer a feared weapon of war, but a treasured artefact. But our story doesn't stop there. Because of its story, and because it's the only running example in the world, Tiger 131 has become more than just a museum exhibit. If you take a look at YouTube and search for Tiger 131, you'll see literally thousands of videos which have been viewed millions of times. And this makes it one of the most visible and viewed artefacts of any kind in any museum anywhere in the world. 
This level of fame meant that when the movie director David Ayer wanted a real Tiger Tank to feature in the film Fury, a brief Google search was all that it took to find Tiger 131. And Tiger 131 can add itself to the distinguished list of Hollywood performers who were also World War II veterans. This appearance brought yet more fame and Tiger 131 subsequently then became immortalised even in pixels, being a tank you can play yourself in the World of Tanks game. And then bricks, and then a whole range of fan merchandise. Tiger 131 draws new admirers every day and the fascination it generates brings visitors to the Tank Museum and draws people to our subject area of armoured warfare. The cultural value of Tiger 131 is far in excess of what you would expect from an individual vehicle. The tank's sheer popularity and the way in which we've got to harness it directly enables us to tell the story of tanks and the men who fought in them. Preserving this tank doesn't mean that we're glorifying either the tiger or the regime that made it. In fact, quite the opposite. Preserving this tank enables us to open up a chapter of history, to tell the stories of those that had to overcome this regime, of the nature of that regime itself, and the way in which tanks like the tiger and their extraordinary expense help to bring it down to the benefit of all of us 75 years later. David, a question that crops up very often at Tiger 131 and certainly about some of the other tanks that you run on the arena, certainly tank fest days and other times, do you really think you should be running them considering the age and the fact that, let's face it, there is going to be one day a stage where one of these breaks and probably a catastrophic, you know, it's not going to get repaired, you haven't got the parts for it. Yeah, it's a tricky one because um, I come from a, a fine art background, looking after fine art works in galleries and everything, and there's a, a really strong convention about how you're supposed to preserve, look after, restore works of art for 20th century mass-produced industrial items we just don't have that same set of guidance. So um, you imagine going to a clock museum and not seeing any mechanical clock in that museum working, you might feel a bit short changed. So there's some areas of, of uh, technological history we're used to seeing working. There's other areas where, you know, the aeroplanes is a classic area where we've got real, real problems of um, if a plane fails, it not only drops out the sky, but you lose a <laughs> pilot as well. And no yeah, one's life's, yeah. you know, worth losing just for that sake of trying to um, put things in front of the public. So, you know, so there's different elements. Now, with tanks, one of the things we know that running a tank is really important to helping people understand some of those issues about it. But let's not kid ourselves. You know, we're not using the guns. We're not firing at ranges. We're not doing all sorts of things. So we're only explaining some of the things by running it. And we do also know one of the other problems we've all got as well is we know that by running it, we're damaging it. What we are trying to do, though, is we know all these objects we're looking after on a downward curve. They are going to sort of return to base oxide one day in the future. All we're droning is slowing that up. At points, by speeding that up, by running the vehicle, doing certain things to do with it, by, but by bringing so many people to the subject, and, you know, another one of these issues, if we hadn't run the Tiger when we did, we would have lost those people who were there when it was captured, who knew about yeah. it, knew some of the stories, etc. So, again, running these vehicles in 20 years' time, it'll be a very different, it will have been gone from living memory. So there's a whole host of issues that you come into. And my own feeling is that some organisations criticise other ones for running things, etc. My own thought is look at that particular organisation, look at its remit, look at it, what it's there for. Um, you know, we try to do it with the least wear and tear as possible, but equally, what are we trying to save? What's significant about that vehicle? Host of really complex issues there. Um, but think about that as well of the viewers, which is, you know, what are we trying to do when, we, um, when people are saying, oh, run this, run that. That's not our complete aim. You know, running is part of it, but that's, you know, it's also preservation. We are a charity here at the Tank Museum, so if you can support us, please do. Consider joining our Patreon scheme or becoming a member of the Friends 
any donations will go directly towards the Tank Museum and its activities.